If you remember, brothers and sisters, from our previous sessions, we mentioned that Surah at tawbah was revealed approximately two years before the death of the Holy Prophet. And this surah carries special historical significance because it gives us a glimpse into the psyche of the companions of the Prophet in the Prophet's last days. The Mufassirin mention a reason why this particular verse was revealed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Aj'altum siqayat al-Hajj wa imarat al-Masjid al-Haram Kaman aman billahi wal yawm al-Akhir wa jahad fi sabili Allah La yastawun عند Allah Wallahu la yahdi al-Qawm al-Zalimin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 19 of Surah At-Tawbah He says or do you consider giving drink to the pilgrims and maintaining the sacred mosque to be like those who believe in God and the last day and strive in God's way? They are not equal in God's eyes and God does not guide the wrongdoers. The Mufassirin, they say that there was a conversation that took place between two companions of the Prophet where they were basically claiming merit for themselves. They were arguing about who is better in the eyes of God. And this goes to show that there was competition between the Sahaba. The companions of the Holy Prophet were competitive. You know, some argued that they were better than others. There was an element of jealousy and envy among some of the companions. So, the narrations say that Shayba and Abbas, Shayba, a companion of the Prophet, and Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, the, the narration says, كَانَ يَفْتَخِرُ كُلٌّ مِّنْهُمَا عَلَىٰ صَاحِبِ So Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, who's a Muslim at this time, and Shayba, who's also another Muslim. So you have two companions who are doing tafakhur, they're claiming merit for themselves. They're trying to establish that one, one of them is superior to the other. As they are debating and discussing who is superior, who has more merit, who's more honorable, the narration says that Ali ibn Abi Talib passes by as they're discussing and as they're boasting about their credentials. فَقَالَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ فِيمَا تَتَفَاخَرَانَ What are you claiming merit over? فَقَالَ الْعَبَّاسِ Abbas, a companion of the Prophet, the uncle of the Prophet. He says, حُبِيتُ بِمَا لَمْ يُحْبَ بِهِ أَحَدْ وَهُوَ سِقَايَةُ الْحَاجِ he says, I, am, I have been given an honor that no other person has been given. And therefore, I am superior to others. I'm superior to Sheba. Because I used to be the one who used to give drink, used to give water to the Hajjaj. In Zamanul Jahiliya, I used to do this. So I have this honor. Faqala Sheba. Sheba, another companion of the Prophet. He responds. To Abbas, قال إني أعمر المسجد الحرام وأنا سادن الكعبة. That I am the maintainer of Masjid al-Haram and I am the custodian of the Kaaba, and therefore I am better than you. So you see from this narration that there was this sense of competition between the Sahaba. So this idea that all of the Sahaba, you know, they loved each other and there was no jealousy or envy among them, amongst them is, is inaccurate. So you see some companions are arguing that they're better than others. So as this conversation is taking place, Amir al-Mu'mineen passes by and he hears them. 
فَقَالَ عَلِيٌّ So Abbas, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, is claiming merit based on the fact that he had the honorable position of being the one who distributes water to the pilgrims. Shayba claims to be superior because he says that I'm the custodian of the Kaaba and I maintain Masjid al-Haram. فَقَالَ عَلِيٌّ أَنِّي مُسْتَحِمْ مِنْكُمَا He says, I'm embarrassed to say this. فَلِي مَعَ صِغَرِ سِنِّي مَا لَيْسَ عِنْدَكُمَا The Imam alayhi salam, and at this, at this point, Amir al-Mu'mineen is about 31 years old. Abbas and Shayba, they're elderly. They're pro pr presumably older than the Prophet. In their 70s, 80s, Amir al-Mu'mineen says that I have a merit that neither of you have despite my young age. That even though I'm younger than you, I have an achievement that neither of you can claim. So, فَقَالَ وَمَا ذَاك? They say to Ali ibn Abi Talib, what, what do you have? What merit do you possess that we lack? What makes you distinguished from us? فَقَالَ عَلِيٌّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ جَاهَدْتُ بِسَيْفِي حَتَّى آمَنْتُمَا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِ The Imam alayhi salam, he says, it is because of my jihad, my struggles, that you too became Muslim. If it were not for my sword, Islam would have not survived and you would have not come to this religion. So I struggled, I fought in the battlefields, I sacrificed. Abbas, and he's also the, the uncle of Amir al-Mu'mineen. فَخَرَجَ الْعَبَّاسُ مُغْضِبًا إِلَى النَّبِي Al-Abbas was not happy about this. He was upset. He was offended by what Ali ibn Abi Talib had said. So he went to the Prophet. He angrily went to the Prophet. شَاكِيًا عَلِيًا Complaining about Ali. That Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't consider it a big deal that I was the one who used to distribute drinks to the pilgrims. أَلَا تَرَى مَا يَقُولُ Al-Abbas says, Ya Rasulullah, look at what Ali is saying. Do you accept this? فَقَالَ النَّبِي The Holy Prophet says to Abbas, call upon Ali ibn Abi Talib. Let, let me speak to him. أُدْعُ لِي عَلِيًا فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُ عَلِي when Amir al-Mu'mineen comes to the Prophet, Rasulullah says to him, لِمَا كَلَّمْتَ عَمَّكَ الْعَبَّاسِ بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْكَلَامِ Why did you say these words to the Prophet? What, what caused you to say this? Amir al-Mu'mineen explains the incident and he says, إِذَا, كن, إذا كُنْتُ أَغْضَبْتُهُ فَلِمَا بَيَّنْتُ مِنَ الْحَقِّ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَرْضَ بِالْقَوْلِ بِالْحَقِّ the Imam says, I only spoke the truth. If he wishes to be pleased with the truth, let him be pleased with the truth. If he wishes to be upset because he heard the word of haq, then let him be upset. So this dispute takes place. Abbas is claiming superiority over others because he gave he used to give drink to the pilgrims. Shayba says that I was the custodian of the Kaaba. I maintained Masjid al-Haram. And Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, listen, the criterion for greatness is not who distributes water to Hajjaj or who maintains Masjid al-Haram. True honor is to sacrifice for the sake of Allah, to struggle for the sake of Allah. So Jibra'il descends upon the Prophet and he says, Ya Muhammad, inna rabbaka yuqri'uka salam wa yaqul utlu hadhihi al-ayat. Jibra'il reveals this ayah. Aja'altum siqayat al-hajj wa imarat al-masjid al-haram kaman amana billahi wal yawm al-akhir wa jahada fi sabeel Allah. That do you consider? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this ayah in support of what Ali ibn Abi Talib had said, that you, you think that giving water 
to Hajjaj and maintaining Masjid al-Haram, this is what makes you honorable. What makes you honorable is to sacrifice in the way of Allah, is to have Iman, it's to struggle in the way of Allah. So you see, my dear brothers and sisters, what I want to point your attention to is that who became offended and upset with Ali ibn Abi Talib? His uncle, Al Abbas. There was a bit of animosity towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. There was a bit of envy and jealousy towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. So if the uncle of the Prophet, Al Abbas, had a bit of resentment toward Ali ibn Abi Talib when Amir al Mu'min was mentioning his own fadail, why does it surprise us? that others had animosity towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this is happening when? This is two years before the death of the Prophet. So you see, my dear brothers and sisters, the historical significance of this surah, it allows us to understand what was happening in the last days of the Prophet's life. Now you find that one of the practices of the Arab during Zaman al-Jahiliya is that even before Islam, people used to descend upon Mecca and they used to perform Hajj. And even the Mushrikeen, they emphasized the importance of serving the Hujjaj. And they emphasized the importance of maintaining the Kaaba. You know, brothers and sisters, one of the few things that the Arabs of Jahiliyyah took from Ibrahim was this culture of generosity. The Mushrikeen of Quraysh are many things. They have many vices and shortcomings, and they've committed many crimes. But one of their virtues that no one can deny is that they were hospitable and they were very generous people. And this is something that their forefathers learned from the, the tradition of Ibrahim You see, brothers and sisters, Ibrahim السلام, was known to be a very generous and accommodating and hospitable person. In fact, when Ibrahim السلام, built the Kaaba along with the assistance of Ismail, you can imagine how how proud he was of completing the construction of Baytullah. Imagine you're given this task, the task of raising the foundations of the Kaaba, and you build the Kaaba. After you complete this task, you can imagine how joyful you would feel. You would feel this sense of accomplishment. So after constructing the Kaaba, there are, there's a hadith that says that Ibrahim began to gaze at the Kaaba. So proud, so pleased with the fact that he had completed this holy task. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Ibrahim, saying, Oh Ibrahim, are you pleased? Are you happy? Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Yes, of course. I had the honor of building your house. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Ibrahim saying that this is not something that should make you proud. You put brick upon brick. Ya Ibrahim, why are you so happy? Hal ashba'ta ja'i'an? Oh Ibrahim, did you feed a hungry person? Hal awayta musharradan? Did you give refuge to a person who has no home? Hal kasawta uriyana? Did you give clothes to someone who was naked? Did you help the poor? What did you do that's making you so proud? So you see at this moment, Ibrahim alayhi salam recognizes that there are things, there are deeds that are even greater than reconstructing the house of Allah. And that is to look after Allah's servants. And this is why Ibrahim alayhi salam he used to always have a meal with someone. He never used to eat by himself. Whenever he would prepare any food, Ibrahim السلام, used to go out and he used to call anyone who's in the street to come and join him 
for dinner or for lunch. And on one occasion, Ibrahim السلام, had prepared food. He goes outside and he finds a man and he invites him in his home. They sit, Ibrahim says, before we eat, let us invoke Allah's name. Let us express our gratitude to Allah. Let us mention his name. The man was a kafir. He says, I, will, I, don't, I don't believe in God. I'm not going to mention his name. Ibrahim السلام, became upset, angry. He says, no, you have to mention the name of Allah if you want to join me and have this meal with me. The man refuses. Ibrahim السلام, becomes angry and he kicks him out. He says, no, you have to leave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Ibrahim, Oh Ibrahim, what did you do? Ibrahim says, Ilahi, this man rejects you. He doesn't believe in you. He denies you. He denies your existence. I don't want him to eat the food that I have prepared. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Ibrahim, Ya Ibrahim, I have been feeding him all his life. I have been giving him food all his life. And he rejects me. You could not even give him one meal. So Ibrahim السلام, goes after the man and brings him back. And you see that Ibrahim السلام, had this habit of giving water, giving food. And this is something that the Arabs adopted from the teachings of Ibrahim. So even during the time of Jahiliyyah, this Siqayatul Hajj was an important position because. Mecca is a desert. The one who's giving water to the Hajjaj is essentially keeping them alive. He's sustaining them. So this was considered a very prestigious position for any person to occupy. But in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that these, these things, these positions don't have value. They don't have value unless they're done for my sake. What has more value is the one who struggle, who believes in me. If you want your actions to have value, you have to connect them to Allah. You have to have faith. You have to believe in the hereafter. You have to struggle, fi sabilillah. Not just struggle. You have to have ikhlas. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the next verse, He elaborates. So Allah says that, those who give drink to the pilgrims and maintain Masjid al-Haram are not better, are not superior to those who strive in my way. Those who strive in my way, they are greater in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in ayah number 20, Allah says, الَّذِينَ آمَنْ وَهَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ أَعْظَمُ دَرَجَةً عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَائِزُونَ Those who believe, and you can consider this ayah as primarily a reference to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen is, is at the top of the list when we're speaking about الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَهَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ أَعْظَمُ دَرَجَةً عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَائِزُونَ Allah says those who believe and migrate and strive in the way of God with their wealth and their selves are greater in rank in the eyes of God and it is they who are the triumphant. Now it's interesting that when you look at this verse, Allah says, الَّذِينَ آمَنْ وَهَاجَرُوا Not everyone who believed migrated with the Prophet. So after Iman is mentioned, Allah mentions Hijrah. There were many people who converted to Islam who did not join the Prophet on his Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. So you have mu'mineen who believed in the Prophet but decided to stay in Mecca. Why did they decide to stay in Mecca? Because they have a lot of attachments. Their belongings, they have real estate, they have homes. They have things that are connecting them to Mecca. So they weren't willing 
to uproot their lives and join Rasulullah in his hijrah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those who believe, we're talking about those who have the highest position in the eyes of God. They're not just the ones who believed and stayed in the comforts of their homes in Mecca. They are the ones They believed in Rasulullah and they migrated with him from Mecca to Medina. They left everything behind. They left their homes. They left maybe even extended family. And they were moving to a city that perhaps they knew no one. It was a new city, a foreign land. They perhaps had to borrow money from people. It's not easy, brothers and sisters. Can you imagine right now, I tell you, imagine, you know, the 12th Imam and Imam Sahib al-Zaman reappears. And he asks you, whether you're in Seattle and Vancouver, any part of the world, he says, I want you now to join me in Kufa. You have to leave. Oh, but I have a job, I have a mortgage, I have a car, I have all of these things that are connecting me to my city. And I go to Kufa, oh, there's no electricity in Kufa, right? 12, 15 hours, no electricity. I don't know the culture. You think the people who were with Rasulullah, it was, it was a culture shock for them. You know, Mecca was a business district. Medina is farmland. It's like moving from the city out into the country. This is what it was like for the Muslims to move from Mecca to Medina. It's not easy. Imagine now the 12th Imam السلام, says, you come with me on a hijrah to Kufa or to another part of the world. Are you able to do this? It's not easy. It's easier said than done. To uproot your life, to go to a city essentially empty-handed, to put your full trust in Allah, to join in the suffering with the Prophet. There are those who join the Prophet. If Rasulullah has been driven out of Mecca and he's going to Medina empty-handed, we want to join him in his hardships. We want to be there with him. We want to support him. So Allah says, those who believe and migrated, the ones who stayed behind in Mecca, they have a certain rank before Allah. But those who believed and migrated with the Prophet, they have a higher position. And then what does Allah say? وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَهَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ So you have those who believe, the ones who migrated and the ones who fought in jihad. Not everyone who went on the hijrah with the Prophet from Mecca to Medina, not all of them used to go to the battlefield. Some of them used to chicken out. Some of them used to give excuses. Oh, Ya Rasulullah, I think I left my door open. I have to go check. They make up excuses. Oh, I can't now. I have some things I got to do. I'll catch up with you later. Not everyone who joined the Prophet on his hijrah were willing to put their lives in danger. وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ This is a very important part of the ayah. You know, brothers and sisters, the first battle of Islam took place 15 years after the Ba'tha. You know, oftentimes the religion of Islam is described as a religion of warfare. Rasulullah is a warmonger. The reality is, 13 years in Mecca, the Prophet was preaching. He was being assaulted, persecuted. He never drew his sword. Only in the second year after the Hijrah, in a defensive war, permission is given to the Prophet to fight. Now, the Islamic State is new. It's still in its infancy. You know, brothers and sisters, when you join the army, Typically, you're assigned a salary, right? You know, if someone, you know, wants to join the army, usually they give them a sign-on bonus. You know, you get a salary, you get paid. 
to join the armed forces. During the time of the Prophet, Rasulullah was not giving a salary to someone who's going and fighting alongside him in jihad. There was no salary. In fact, at the time of the Prophet, jihad actually had two components. You have to put your life in danger, and you also have to spend your own money to buy a horse, to buy weapons, to buy a shield. So jihad also had a monetary sacrifice. So not only are you going to put your life in danger, you have to buy your own weapons. You have to have a shield. You have to have a horse. And some of the Sahaba, of course, were more wealthy than others. Some of them would have to buy their own weapons, their own horses, and they would have to sponsor other poor companions. So if there's a companion, he wants to fight, but he doesn't have a horse, he doesn't have a sword, he doesn't have a shield. Some of the rich Sahaba would sponsor another Muslim and pay the money so they can join them in jihad. So you see that there was, and buying a horse, it's, it's the equivalent of, of buying a car for someone. It's a huge monetary investment. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَجَاهَدُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ That they strive in the way of God with their wealth and their lives. Because there's an element of wealth in the equation when it comes to jihad. The Prophet is not supplying horses or weapons. You have to buy it yourself. In fact, at the time of the Prophet, there were many companions who wanted to fight. They wanted to protect Islam. They wanted to defend Rasulullah. But Rasulullah had to turn them away because they didn't have weapons. They didn't have enough money to purchase horses or shields. or. And, there, and this is alluded to in Surah At-Tawbah, and we'll come to this inshallah, in ayah number 92, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that there is no blame on those who don't fight in jihad, especially the ones. So this is ayah number 92 from, from Surah At-Tawbah. وَلَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ إِذَا مَا أَتَوْكَ لِتَحْمِلَهُمْ قُلْتَ لَا أَجِدُوا مَا أَحْمِلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ Some companions would come to the Prophet and they say, Ya Rasulullah, we want to fight. Rasulullah did not have any saddles, any mounts for them to sit on. Meaning, there was a very low supply for them. There were, weapons were not available. And the Prophet would have to turn, would have to turn them away. He would send them back. There were not enough horses and there were not enough weapons to be given to all of those who were interested in fighting. So when Rasulullah would turn some of them away, Some of the Sahaba, because they were too poor to purchase weapons, Rasulullah would send them back and the Quran says their eyes would fill with tears because they missed out on the opportunity to be with Rasulullah and to defend Islam in the battlefield. وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ So those who believe, migrate, and fight in the way of Allah, strive in the way of Allah with their wealth and their selves, they possess a greater rank in the eyes of Allah. Now, I want to speak for a few moments about this concept of darajah. What does it mean to occupy a rank before God? A great rank. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Verse 163, he says, Hum darajatun People occupy different ranks before God. There is no 
you will never find two people who have the same daraja in the eyes of Allah. It's impossible. Every human being has their own daraja, their own rank and status before God. Why? Because every human being is unique in the same way that every human being has a unique fingerprint. Every human being has a daraja, a rank before God. Because everything that you do, everything that you even think about has an impact on your soul. And there are no two people in history that have the same a'mal and the same thoughts. And therefore, because each human being has a different thought pattern and we have different actions, we all occupy distinct ranks before God. Now in dunya, it might be difficult for you to distinguish who has a higher rank than the other. You know, sometimes even when it comes to prophets, you might not know who has a higher daraja than the, than the other. So for example, if I ask you now, who is greater in the eyes of Allah, Shu'aib or Harun? Who is greater in the eyes of Allah, Yahya or Yusuf? We don't know. They have different ranks, but we don't know who is above the other. Because even, and even, in, even among people in our community, it's not really clear who has a higher daraja and who has a lower daraja. So in dunya, there are darajat. People have ranks. When do these ranks become very clear? When does this hierarchy become very visible to us? Allah answers this. In, uh, in Surah number 17, Surah Al-Isra, Ayah number 21. Allah says, Unzur kayfa faddalna ba'dahum ala ba'd. Look at how we have given favor to others over others. Some people have certain fadha'id. Some people have virtues that come more naturally to them than others. So there is tafweed. There are ranks in dunya. And then Allah says, akbaru darajat wa akbaru The darajat become very distinct and very clear in the akhirah. In the akhirah, it will be very clear what this daraja, what pers what daraja this person occupies, what rank that person occupies. Why? Because what, what, is, what was hidden in dunya has now become divulged. You know, the, the day of judgment is, as Allah says, يَوْمَ تُبْلَ السَّرَائِرِ The day in which the secrets will be divulged. We don't really know the reality of people. In dunya, you may see someone, they pray, they fast. They're seemingly good people, they're righteous. But you don't know what the niya is. You don't know what the intentions are. You don't know what people do behind closed doors. But in the akhirah, the darajat are very clear. The ranks become very distinct and clear. Now, in the next ayah, ayah number 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the reward that he's going to give to those believers who migrated, who fought in jihad, who sacrificed their wealth and their lives in the way of Allah. Those individuals who struggle and strive for the sake of God. Allah says, what is their reward? يُبَشِّرُهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِّنْ وَرِضْوَانٍ وَجَنَّاتٍ لَهُمْ فِيهَا نَعِيمٌ مُقِيمٌ Allah says, their Lord gives them glad tidings of mercy from Him and contentment and gardens wherein they shall have lasting bliss. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them glad tidings. And He promises them three things. 
and I'll, I'll, I'll speak about each one of these things individually. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives glad tidings to these special mu'mineen who believe, who go on hijrah, who basically endure the hardships of life for the sake of God, who put themselves through difficulty for the sake of preserving their deen and the deen of others. Allah says, I give them the glad tidings of Rahmah. Rahmah is number one. Ridwan is number two. And Jannat is number three. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُبَشِّرُهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِّنْ Allah gives them the glad tidings of Rahma. Now you may wonder, what is so special about Allah promising them Rahma? Isn't everyone a recipient of Rahma? Now presumably Allah is giving them a special reward. But Rahma is given to everybody. In Dua Kumayl, what do we recite? The first line of Dua Kumayl, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi rahmatika allati wasi'at kulla shay. Oh Allah, I ask you by your mercy that encompasses all things. So if Allah's mercy encompasses all things, what's so special about this glad tiding that he's giving to these special believers? The answer to this question is found in the Basmala. You know, when we say Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim are two names of God. And they're both derived from the word Rahman. So this indicates that there are two aspects of divine mercy. There's Allah's Rahmaniya, His universal mercy. The mercy that reaches every created being, even Iblis. Even Iblis, even Shaytan enjoys this universal mercy. Why? Because He exists. And existence is a mercy of God. But this is not the mercy that Allah is promising these mu'mineen. Because this is mercy that's given to everyone. What Allah is promising them is what? The second type of mercy, where He says, Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman is the universal mercy. Ar-Rahim is Allah's special mercy that He gives to those who seek Him to those who love him, those who desire his proximity. So this Rahimiyya is what we're talking about. Now what does it mean when Allah showers us with this type of Rahmah? What it means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them special guidance. He guides them. He tries to bring them close to Him. You know, this is why the Qur'an is called the Book of Rahman. You know, when someone is very dear to you, when you, have, when you want to show someone a lot of mercy and affection, you want to bring them close to you. You know, if I have a child and I want to show them love and mercy and affection, I want to bring them close to me. Similarly, when Allah gives the glad tidings of his mercy to these special believers, he's essentially guiding them. He wants to bring them close to him. And this is why if you turn to Surat Al-Isra, Surah number 17, Ayah number 82, Allah, when he speaks about the Qur'an, what does he say? وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ That Qur'an is called a book of healing. Why? Because the Qur'an, if it is read and studied, and if you 
follow its guidance, it removes the diseases of the heart. It allows the heart to heal. It allows the heart to remove those spiritual contaminants. It's shifa. If your heart has become sick because of sin, this Quran is like medicine. It's shifa. It gives healing. And this Quran is rahma for the believers because the Quran brings you closer to God. It's a, it's a source of guidance. It brings it. So when Allah says He shows them mercy, He will design your life in a way that will bring you closer to Him. He will facilitate the journey that will bring you close to Him. Even the Prophet, Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Why does Allah call the Prophet a mercy? to humanity, to the worlds. Because Rasulullah brings people close to God. This is why he's a rahmah lil alam. He's, he's a mercy to the world because he brings us close to the, the, the most merciful, which is Allah. So the Quran brings you close to God. Rasulullah is a rahmah lil alam because he brings you close to God. So the glad tidings that Allah is giving these believers who are struggling and striving is that I'm going to bring you close to me. You might go through hardships, you might go through difficulties, but all of this is being arranged so I can bring you close to myself. This is a rahmah, this is hidayah. But this is not the only thing that Allah promises. These mu'mineen. يُبَشِّرُهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِّنْ He gives them the glad tidings of mercy from him. وَرِضْوَانٍ Number two is رضوان. If you look at the Qur'an, رضوان is always mentioned in the context of the Akhirah. Now in dunya, ideally, we're always seeking Allah's radwan. We're always seeking Allah's pleasure. We're, all, we're always seeking His contentment. But radwan in the Qur'an is always used to describe Allah's pleasure and Allah's contentment with the believers in Jannah. If you go to Surah, again, Surah at tawbah ayah number 72, Allah makes a promise to the believing men and women. And He mentions some of this, the material blessings of paradise. And then He mentions a spiritual blessing in paradise. Allah says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ God promises the believing men and the believing women. What does he promise them? Jannatin tajrimin tahtihal anhar. He promises them gardens through which rivers flow. So Allah is mentioning material blessings, gardens, rivers. Khalidina fiha. They will dwell there for all eternity. And Allah promises them good dwellings. You're going to have beautiful homes. So it's not that Allah gives you a garden and you're, you're sleeping outside. Allah says that you're going to get very beautiful homes, good dwellings. In garden, the gardens of Eden. And then what does Allah say at the end of the ayah? So he mentions gardens, rivers, dwellings. These are all material blessings. And ni'amul madiyah, they're material blessings. And then what does Allah say? وَرِضْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ But the pleasure of God is greater than all of this. 
ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ There's a hadith that I want to share with you where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the mu'mineen when they're in Jannah. So you can imagine, imagine for a moment, the believers are admitted into paradise. They have their spouses, they have their the best food, the best drinks, the best palaces, servants, the best clothes, the jewelry, you name it. They have all of these blessings. The hadith says, Inna Allah yaqul, yaqulu li ahli al-jannah, ya ahli al-jannah. The hadith says Allah will call upon the inhabitants of paradise. Fayaquluna labbayka rabbana wa sa'adayk. The people of Jannah, when the call is made from their Lord, when Allah says, O people of Jannah, they will say, Here we are, our Lord. We are at your service. All goodness is in your hands. Allah will say to them, Are you pleased? Are you happy? The, the inhabitants of paradise, when Allah asks them, Are you pleased? Are you happy? They're, they will say, Our Lord, how can we be not how can we not be happy when you have given us what you have not given to any of your creation? You have given us beyond limit. Allah will then say to them, Fayakul Allah or Atikum Afwala Mindadik. Do you want me to give you something that is greater than everything that I have given you now in Jannah? فَيَقُولُونَ يَا رَبْ وَأَيُّ شَيْءٍ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ Ya Allah, you have given us everything. What could be greater than what you have given us? The malaika are our servants. We're in the company of prophets. We have the best food, the best drinks, peace, harmony. We have all of these blessings. What could be greater than all of this? Allah says, أَحِلُّ عَلَيْكُمْ رِضْوَانِي فَلَا أَسْخَطُ عَلَيْكُمْ بَعْدَهُ أَبَدًا I will now expose you to my pleasure. Allah says, I'm pleased with you. The moment Ahlul Jannah hear this announcement, that Allah says, I am pleased with you and you will never incur my wrath, they will experience a pleasure and a joy that is more intense than any pleasure that any of the material blessings in Jannah can give them. So this Ridwan is something that we, we will not understand. You know, just to give you a glimpse, a sense of what I'm talking about, imagine you love someone, you're obsessed with them. And say for many years they've never noticed you. And then finally, that person who you love and you're obsessed with says to you that you are very dear to me, that I, I'm happy to know you. Being acknowledged and loved by someone that you love is one of the greatest pleasures. Imagine that feeling you get. When a human being that you love reciprocates the love. So imagine you fall in love with someone and you're wondering, do they feel the same way? When you discover that the feeling is mutual, that feeling, that joy, that pleasure, imagine that happening between the creator and the created. Now this joy that you feel is because another human being reciprocated love. How about Allah? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm pleased with you, you're dear, I love you. Imagine this type of pleasure. And the, the reality is we're not going to know what this is until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to enter paradise. 
وَرِضْوَانٍ وَجَنَّاتٍ لَهُمْ فِيهَا نَعِيمٌ مُقِيمٌ So if we go back to ayah number 20, ayah number 21, Allah promises them رَحْمَ رِضْوَانٍ and جَنَّات Gardens. Now you may think that it's strange that Allah would mention رَحْمَ رِضْوَانٍ if Radwan is the highest thing, the highest pleasure, why are we going back to a material blessing, Jannat? One of the Mufassireen, and this is perhaps the best explanation that I've heard. You know, people who study Arfan, you know, mystical interpretations, there are some mystics that say, you know, we don't want palaces or gardens or food we just want Allah's Ridwan we just want God's pleasure we don't want all of these amenities in Jannah it's as though this is a refutation of the mystics that say we want Ridwan Allah but we don't want Jannah the only way that you can experience so you need Allah's Rahmah to earn this Ridwan but this Ridwan is only experience in Jannah. These blessings, the material, the spiritual blessings in paradise, they're everlasting. And then if we go to the, the next ayah, ayah number 22, Inna Allaha indahu ajrun azim. They will dwell therein for all eternity. Surely with God is the greatest reward. Now, both paradise and hellfire are eternal. Because Jannah and Jahannam they are essentially manifestations of the soul. And because the soul is eternal, Jannah and Jahannam necessarily are eternal. Now, punishment, you know, when you think about adab, what is adab? What is punishment? Punishment is the, re the reality of sin. It's the manifestation of sin. And reward, thawab, is the reality of good deeds plus divine mercy. Now, why do I say plus divine mercy? There's an ayah in the Quran in Surah Al An'am, verse 160, where Allah says, Man ja'a bil hasan, whoever brings a good deed. And notice that Allah says, whoever brings a good deed. Why does Allah say, man ja'a bil hasan? Because you might perform a lot of good deeds, but you burn them by doing ghiba. You burn them with your sins. You are lucky, you're successful if you can do a good deed and carry it with you to the akhirah. Most of us, we, we do good deeds, but we burn our hasanat in dunya. We burn them. He who brings a good deed, you protect this amal salih. You know, this is why there's a hadith where when Rasulullah used to say, if you remember Allah, if you praise Allah, a tree is planted in paradise for you. So one of the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, there must be a lot of trees in Jannah because we're always saying, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. Rasulullah says, yes, perhaps. But be careful not to set fire to those trees with your sins. So Allah here says, Man ja'a bil hasan. Whoever brings a good deed, you secure it, you don't destroy it. Falahu ashru amthaliha. Allah multiplies it by 10 at the bare minimum. So reward is the reality of your good deed, and Allah adds to it. Allah multiplies it. The actual, what you deserve. For your salah is less than what you're given in Jannah. It's more than the, the, the reward that you should be given for your prayer is actually less than what Allah actually gives you. 
So reward is the reality of your good deed in addition to this rahma and this mercy and generosity. So Allah adds to good deeds, but Allah does not add to punishment. وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيَّةِ And whoever brings a sin, فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مثله. You are punished in accordance to that sin. Meaning, the punishment fits the crime. But the reward does not fit the good deed. Allah is very generous. And Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ أَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ And I'll conclude with this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes, you know, when the Prophet used to encourage the Sahaba to fight, you know, as I said, many of them used to give excuses. They would be reluctant. They'd want to stay because they don't want to die. They're attached to the dunya. Allah tells the Prophet, tell them, O Muhammad, that this dunya that they're attached to, قُلْ مَتَاعُ الدُّنْيَا قَلِيلٌ that all of the pleasures, if you imagine all of the delights and the pleasures of dunya, all of them, Allah calls it qaleel. All of the enjoyments, the delights of this earthly life, if you combine it together, Allah says it's qaleel. He calls it something very insignificant. But what does Allah say about his the reward that he has prepared? For these mu'mineen. He says what? إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ أَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ When Allah speaks about what is prepared in the hereafter, He calls it عَظِيم. It's great. When Allah speaks about the enjoyments of dunya in its totality, He says it's قَلِيل. مَتَاعٌ قَلِيل. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين